Go. The next model that we need to look at moving on from Unit 2 with you know, the various indicators into Unit 3 with ADAS is the aggregate demand and aggregate supply model. The word aggregate, or if you aggregate something, means that you are combining it. So in a nutshell, aggregate demand is the combination of all of the demand curves. Which sounds a little bit silly, and in some respects it probably is. This is one of those concepts that some people don't like about macroeconomics because it's like, okay, we're getting so big that can we really draw conclusions about something that does not actually exist? Well, the answer is that it does give us some valuable information that helps us develop economic policy. So it is useful, but it is extraordinarily abstract because we're adding together everything. So if aggregate demand is all the demand curves, then technically aggregate supply is going to be all the supply curves. Now, in practical terms, if we can find some practical terms here, what are we actually doing? In order to figure out the level of aggregate demand, we need to know what our determinants are. And conveniently enough, they are exactly the same factors that we already looked at for your GDP equation if you're using the expenditures approach. So we're still looking at C plus I plus G plus net exports. Same thing. Now, the tricky part is knowing which factors you want to try to change at which times based on overall how the economy is doing. And this is where you really have to know the graphs inside, outside, backwards, upside down, and every other which way you can think of. All right. So if we start with aggregate demand, this is going to essentially look just like what you've seen already for regular demand curves, except you're going to have really big numbers. So instead of price on your vertical axis, we're going to put price level. Price level referring to what's happening with overall prices in the economy. If you have the price level rising, then we have inflation as measured by things like the CPI. So instead of price, it's price level. Same idea, much bigger concept. Now, along the bottom axis, instead of looking at just quantity demanded, we need to look at it in terms of the total quantity demanded. We're going to call that GDP. Now, your aggregate demand curve is going to be downward sloping. Now, it doesn't really matter if you draw this slightly curved or very curved or a straight line. From what I've seen with all of the AP rubrics that I've dealt with, they don't much care as long as you put it in a reasonable place on the graph. Now, what causes this curve to shift? If your factors that comprise or make up aggregate demand are C, I, G, and net exports, then if you increase any of these, you increase aggregate demand, which means it slides to the right. And as I've told you before, don't think of this in terms of up and down because you will get things backwards. Right is away from zero, that's an increase. Left is towards zero, that's a decrease. So what are some of the things that we might try to do to increase aggregate demand? And when would we want to do that? 
Well, thinking back to your circular flow model, if the overall level of spending in an economy is down such that the economy is in a recession or the level of economic activity is depressed, for example, you can think of it in either one of those terms, really, then you want to boost spending. So anything the government can do to increase any of these factors, oops, pretend that's over there, will increase aggregate demand. Okay, that's easy. Okay, fine. So the government institutes a spending program. We've heard a lot of talk about um, building infrastructure, for example. That's like a shot in the arm for a sick economy. Government launches a new spending program. Aggregate demand increases. That would do it. And the nice thing about government spending is that 100% of the money actually goes into GDP and into aggregate demand. That's not what happens with a lot of other government policies that they may try. Okay? How are we doing on time? Uh, you got four minutes left, maybe? Okay. Three. All right. You're, you're, you're looking good on time. Now, if the government wants, for example, to affect consumer spending, one of the things that is typically considered is a tax break or a tax rebate. Either you change the rate of the tax or you give people money back on taxes they've already filed, something like this. The problem is that the government lowers taxes. That's like step one. Step two, people don't spend 100% of the money. Okay? Maybe the government should give people tax rebates as like Best Buy gift cards. Well, it, it is a big problem, though, because you have several issues with trying to pass government legislation to institute policy. But the biggest one with a tax break is that people don't spend all of it. It is diluted. Because when people take part of that money and save it, you have two options. You can spend it or you can save it. The amount that they save gets pulled out of that spending stream. If you're talking about velocity of money with circular flow, that becomes a leakage. You can think of it literally like, you know, the drain in a bathtub isn't closed all the way. The government pours in the money. Some of it spills out because people hang on to it. They don't spend all of it. And the amounts to which they do and do not spend can have a big impact, and that's what we'll do next.